All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our next session of the day. Apologies for the hiccups in our previous session. I promise that Yos will come back with a recorded session, and then we will do a follow-on Q&A with her uh, sometime in the coming weeks. So those of you that were curious about the future of learning and education, uh, I promise we'll come back and cover those. But for this session, we have Peter Zing, who joins us here from Australia and our amazing partners um, out in that part of the world. And he's going to be talking about opportunities for automation and remote delivery of goods and services uh, in this time when we're all confined to our, our homes. So Peter is a keynote speaker and writer on emerging technologies and their impact on humanity. He also works on technology and growth initiatives at KPMG. They help organizations navigate and flourish in these unprecedented times of change and disruption. Like I said, he's also part of the Singularity U Australia team as an advisory board member and faculty, and he is an executive member of the Science Party in Australia, a political party committed to upholding the scientific method in policymaking. Thanks for joining us, Peter. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for having me. Wow, it's fantastic to be here, guys, and um, you know, glad you're joining in. You know, in the times of these changes. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the opportunities for more automation and the remote delivery of goods and services in light of COVID-19. And I think there's the opportunity, the upside right now is the burning platform for the digital transformation ecosystem. Um, my associate director role at Technology and Growth, you know, we help these large organisations thrive in these circumstances. And uh, in Australia, we're actually helping with Singularity University getting through the executive program. I want to start off with um, the scarcity problem that we have now in terms of our mindset and then also the abundance that we want to get to. So toilet paper scarcity is one example. I think it's a prisoner's dilemma in that, you know, we're all prisoners in our home right now and we can either hoard or not hoard and the outcomes will depend on how we collaborate with each other. And But it's not a zero-sum game. So we talked about that, how that we can get to that journey of abundance. We've seen in Australia that, um, you know, there's been just absolute chaos in the supermarkets, but this is happening all around the world. Uh, you can see there was an actual fight that occurred in our local Woolworths. So this will be our Wal uh, the Walmart equivalent. And these two actually started fighting, these three, because of um, there's only a limited number of toilet paper on the shelves. And right here, this lady actually just wanted one pack, one pack from that sort of stash over there. But the mother and daughter said no, because they wanted to keep that for their family. And it's totally understandable, but, you know, right now we're living in that sort of scarcity mindset. And it's happening all around the world. And in the bottom right there is from New Zealand. Um, and over here you can actually see that this is actually not just limited to toilet paper now. It's limited. It's starting to apply to every single non-perishable good. And Woolworths is actually limiting all items sold in the category amid the coronavirus panic. But uh, unfortunately, this is how things are playing out, out in society. Um, there's a lot of people sort of trying to come up with why reasons, the reasons why there's sort of a lot of this panic buying. Um, one of our colleagues uh, at KPMG, David Evans, actually wrote a piece on, you know, is the coronavirus panic buying influenced by how we perceive volume? Because, you know, toilet paper rolls take up a lot of space. Humans, our brains aren't designed to sort of measure actual quantity uh, in terms of 3D space. So in terms of taking up a lot of volume, toilet paper does seem to be flying off the shelves. There's been a lot of reasons that have been out in the in the publications and newspapers saying, well, you know, what are the different reasons? Number one, people resort to these extremes when they hear conflicting messages. So the government's not telling them you know, the same thing every day. Uh, reason number two, people are reacting to this lack of clear direction from officials. Number three, the panic buying begets panic buying. So this is the prisoner's dilemma happening. Uh, and reason number four, it's natural to want to overprepare because our evolutionary sort of journey has led us to the point where hunters and gatherers, everybody's gathering right now. Uh, and reason number five, it sort of allows some people to feel a sense of control because there's no cure, no vaccine, no treatment at the moment that we're aware of. Um, you know, people are just saying retail therapy is the only way I can control what I can do for my family. Um, and one of the professors, uh, people um, in Australia, actually the columnist, Waleed Ali, was like, well, one day someone will write a PhD to explain the toilet paper panic. Um, look, this, this is something that we'll get there, but we did a little research on how toilet paper is actually manufactured. Because if we want to get our journey towards in, a, in an age of abundance, we have to have to change our mindset and understanding the production methods and the supply chains that are involved. 
So there's actually an entire documentary on the National Geographic around how toilet paper is manufactured. And surprisingly, it's quite automated. All you really need in terms of inputs is water, energy, and cellulose. So this is found in trees. Uh, apparently, we use 27,000 trees globally every single day just to produce the toilet paper needed for everyone on the planet. And so this is completely unsustainable in the terms of the approach. Um, in terms of this particular example, Subadale Group, um, they use this production method, wood pulp goes in, and also um, you can use recyclable paper, but for the really nice puffy type of toilet paper, that requires wood pulp, so cutting down trees. And so this is sort of the process in the manufacturing plan is quite automated. There's some people still overseeing it, but it's really the distribution from the natural resources, the, the trees going into the plant, and then distribution of the toilet paper going out to the end customers or the warehouses and the shopping centers and then to the end customers is where the sort of supply chain limitations are. So let's go that uh, into that more deeply. Um, from Arc Invest, so this is a you know a company that uh, invests in disruptive innovations, headed by Kathy Wood, who's a Tesla bull. But she makes a lot of sense in terms of the the sort of investments and the logic she makes that you know times of crisis innovation is thriving. And, um, you know, in terms of automation, uh, their definition encompasses industrial robots, service robots, and automation systems powered by neural networks. And so the work I do is really in the sort of automation in terms of finance and other technologies, but using neural networks to do that um, on the digital side. In terms of industrial robots for manufacturing, uh, the service robots for logistics, vacuums, delivery robots, nurse assistants, for example, and for autonomous systems, it's restaurants, production lines. We'll go into those in, in more de in detail. So looking at industrial robots, you know, these are getting more adept with every task. Uh, the startup company um, Vicarious, so this is a secretive startup company that was backed by Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos. They're revealing the sort of progress with the initial customer. Well, you know, after 10 years, it's, that's pretty good. Um, in terms of what they're doing is they're buying off-the-shelf robotic arms and installing the software that they've developed in terms of the image recognition. And uh, what they've actually done before is uh, decode the, the, the capture codes. So it's actually cracked how, you know, I, I am not a robot type button. They've actually cracked how they can see the letters and numbers in the capture codes. Um, so they're applying that sort of same method in terms of recognizing, in this case, jumbled collections of a box of lip balm. And uh, they're actually able to stack them up and plug them into the neat uh, piles that they need to. So you can probably do that with toilet paper and sort of the production lines as well in terms of sorting that. Um, open AI as well on the top right, they've developed a robotic arm that actually can see and, and manage a, a Rubik's Cube. So solving a Rubik's Cube on its own is pretty impressive. But if you get a robotic arm that can do it automatically, that's pretty damn impressive. Um, and the bottom right, you have the you know the Spot Mini and the um, and the Atlas from Boston Dynamics, that's going to be rolling out in terms of the factory floors. Spot Mini is uh, available for lease to use in any sort of use case, as long as it agrees in with uh, their policies. But um, these sort of technologies, these industrial robots are getting more adept with every task. Um, robots will cause a shift from unpaid to paid labor. So what does ARK Invest mean by that? So in terms of automation systems, they can operate much faster than a fast casual, uh, much of a fast casual restaurant. So grocery shopping, food preparation and cleanup, they'll shift from unpaid tasks at home, you know, the home cooked meals to paid jobs at uh, fast casual and other restaurants, as well as their suppliers. So they measured that the cost of a meal uh, by location uh, in the US, for example, for a home cooked meal, you know, when you count the food costs, the food prep and the cleanup costs and the grocery time costs, it's about $12 US. And compare that to say a fast casual restaurant where a lot of the processes are automated, that's going to be reaching cost parity around $12 as well. In terms of that cost of food to the US consumer, um, they've measured that right now that consumers are spending their food outside the home of $930 billion. That's the size of the current market. And um, when you look at what happens in the food inside the home, the unmeasured component, yeah, this non-market activity of about 67%, the total is about $2.4 trillion. So all this food prep that we're doing um, at home, even though we think it's healthier, right, at the moment, um, in terms of that, it's, it's a lot bigger. So that's the addressable market that these automations uh, can do, shifting from unpaid to paid labor. Um, that last mile delivery as well, you know, getting it from the either the casual restaurants or the manufacturing plants to the end consumer is still done by humans, right? This sort of contractor work from Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Foodora in China, it's Meituan and JD.com and Easy. 
And in Europe, uh, the delivery in Globo actually switched on contactless delivery because of the COVID-19 pandemic. People don't want to touch other people while they're touching their food. So, you know, this is sort of thing, an opportunity for automation to happen at the last mile. And we're seeing more and more investment, especially in China, that's happening right now. Um, examples include, you know, the autonomous freight trains that are carrying from, you know, uh, warehouse to warehouse um, and for Uber Eats, you know, it's those delivery drones. Um, we already seen Tesla's uh, auto autonomous vehicles in terms of autopilot. It's going to be coming on full autonomy later this year or early next year. Um, there's the autonomous trucks with Waymo and Too Simple, um, and Amazon Prime's drones that are happening in the last mile. Um, and then this one down here is uh, from uh, actually the JD.com's robot, so getting that sort of last mile delivery happening from the, sh uh, the, the restaurants to the end consumer. Um, this driverless delivery van over here is the Neolix. Um, this is in Wuhan, and um, it's actually backed by Baidu. Um, it's actually seeing a huge demand surge amid the outbreak. So, yeah, quite obviously that's going to happen because and China's trying to fight this coronavirus with delivery drones and all these autonomous uh, robots. So, um, company by, from Antwerp, you know, Japanese company TerraDrone is employing UAV systems to transport medical samples and quarantine samples in China to fight the coronavirus. So they're, they're getting sort of uh, external help as well. And this is MatterNet. So the new drone landing station looks like a sci-fi movie prop because, uh, you know, the doctors can actually go in, put the samples into the space station, and it'll fly off on the drone to deliver to the next testing lab. Um, so this is sort of uh, becoming more and more real, and uh, this burning platform of um, having to rely on autonomy is creating um, greater innovations in this space. Um, so this uh, other research from ARK Invest saying the service robots are penetrating the logistics space, right? So since deploying its first robot in 2012, Amazon has ramped them up roughly 200,000 units in, in its fulfillment centers or increasing the total employment by seven times. So based on these superior economics, the robots are likely to dominate the food delivery space as well. And you can see this sort of trend line along the employees that Amazon's been having and also the robots that are going in proportion to that as well. Um, in terms of cost of delivery, it's going from $1.60 US per mile from a human delivery to 0.96, so that's $0.06 cents for autonomous delivery robot in the US. That's a 95% cost savings. And so this, these are the projections that's happening. Um, in terms of sizing the entire opportunity for automation, ARK Invest thinks that it's going to be an $800 billion adding to the US GDP over the next five years and $12 trillion over the next 15 years. So by 2035, GDP could hit $40 trillion, nearly 40% higher than it would be the case without automation. That's compounding at a 2.4% growth rate instead of one8 So you can see this sort of trend line where in confliction of the curve as we get through GDP with automation. Um, so, but what does all this sort of GDP mean for the average consumer or your average US citizen or globally, so global citizens? So this is where sort of Andrew Yang's campaign, you know, he's running, was, he was running as a uh, Democratic nominee. Um, therefore, his, his freedom dividend of $1,000 a month was proposed for every citizen over 18 years old. So it's twelve thousand dollars a year. He was saying that, you know, so the, the benefits of the automation aren't being passed on to the average US citizen and because it's going to the shareholders of the companies that's creating the value in the automations themselves. Um, you know, his campaign yeah, had to end because, you know, there wasn't that much, uh, as much support as um, they should be. But um, you can see that apparently he thinks apparently he should have been talking about a, the pandemic instead of an automation because, you know, he set up this nonprofit Humanity Forward and now he's actually uh, helping the Trump administration um, understand what a stimulus package with UBI would look like. Uh, with AOC, she's demanding the government distribute the UBI as well and implement a Medicare for All to fight the coronavirus. Um, and here's one of our colleagues, Nathan Waters, in Australia saying, look, you know, that $1.5 trillion US federal stimulus was gone in a matter of 20 minutes. So this is the blip that happened on the day it was announced. And think about what we could have done with that money. And Andrew Yang was saying, well, the $1.5 trillion is enough to give $1,000 a month to everyone in the country for four to five months, you know, getting cash in the hands of consumers to increase business confidence and spending to actually have that Keynesian economic effect. So, you know, there's that recent um, you know, Trump administration listening in on what Andrew's thoughts are in that terms of creating that uh, stimulus package. And this hashtag Yang was right. Yeah. Trending, Hey, Peter, Peter yes. your, uh, your audio just changed. Uh, can you check your audio source? Oh, yeah, sure. 
Uh, it sounds like you are in a bubble now. <laughs> and, uh, Is that a little bit better? Oh, it's way better. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, I'm not sure. It might be just a server thing. Fair enough. All right, you're, you're back. Good to go. <laughs> I'm good. All right. I'm hoping I didn't lose you guys too much um, before, but um, uh, this next topic is going to be on remote working, learning, and automating for self-sufficiency at home and essentially building your own abundance. Um, you know, we've, we've heard earlier around the work from home, around uh, coronavirus, how it's making it see how hard it actually is to work remotely. Um, you know, the, but there is an abundance of uh, technology tools out there, um, you know, whether it's G Suite or Office 365. G Suite just uh, hit on uh, 2 billion monthly active users. And, uh, you know, all these sort of investors are saying, well, invest in Zoom, invest in Slack and Alassian and all those sort of things because this has been a surge in demand on this digital transformation while we have this burning platform. Um, in China, it's Ding Talk and WeChat at work. Ding Talk supported by Alibaba, WeChat with Tencent. Um, but also the challenge from working remotely is that, you know, a lot of companies haven't had to do this full time for their employees. So they're getting, you know, all these gremlins out of the way, just like we are, like with Crowdcast. But um, we're, we're actually, once we make this all smooth, we'll, we'll get to a point where we're going to be more reliant on these technologies and used to the way of working. Um, at KPMG, we, we have a global Microsoft alliance and um, we use Teams. You know, for the first year that we had that Teams available, it was a ghost town. No one, no one knew how to use it. No one, it didn't have critical mass. But now, you know, over the past week that we've been working from home, you know, this has actually exploded in activity because not only are people showing pictures of their work at home desk environment, they're also sharing, you know, all the sort of details about themselves that, um, you know, as throughout the course of their work. And I feel more connected with my fellow colleagues than ever before. Um, in terms of the distractions, though, at home, you can see that, you know, there's a whole bunch of other entertainment self, uh, self-sufficiency self that you can achieve with Netflix and Disney Plus and Apple TV and uh, Prime Video. The choice has been more abundant. And same with the game streaming around GeForce Now and Google Stadia providing uh, 4K availability and Twitch TV. Um, so, you know, there are comments around this, you know, in 1665, this is from uh, James Jansen found this uh, from the Science Party. He said that, you know, well, the Reddit comments said that in 1665, the University of Cambridge temporarily closed due to the bubonic plague. Isaac Newton had to work from home and he used his time to develop calculus and the theory of gravity. So if you're shut down and sent home, be like Isaac, do something productive. And the comments were generally positive, but one, one of the people said, well, Newton didn't have Dark Souls 3 with DLC. So that's an arc, you know, action RPG game and um, with infinite, I guess, you know, constantly new content to play with. So this is sort of um, the challenge that we would essentially get used to in terms of trying to get more productivity at home. Um, obviously, there's a whole raft of things that are available to you know keep you entertained, but also um, in, in remote learning should be adopted quite easily. Now is a perfect time to upskill yourself, whether it's Coursera, Khan Academy, and Skillshare. There are over and Udemy. There's over four, 450 free online courses from Ivy League schools on Class Central. Um, in Australia, there's Newtopia. So this is actually a, a lead generator for other university courses based on your curiosity that are determined through the online platform. So check out Newtopia. Um, and Japanese students have hold a, held their graduation ceremonies for primary school in Minecraft amid the school cancellation. So if kids can do it, we can do it too. Uh, COVID Base is another one where we can actually look at new projects on, on uh, COVID-19. So it's a work in progress curated list of projects, news and data related to COVID-19. Now is that a bit of a better time to start a new project and to upskill yourself in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, for us, um, when we work on automation uh, jobs as well, we have these tools that are available, whether it's Microsoft Azure's uh, automated machine learning, uh, AWS, Google Cloud, and IBM Cloud. Um, there's things like Data Robot and uh, H2O.ai, which is essentially democratizing AI in terms of not needing the um, expertise of a data scientist to actually run a lot of these machine learning algorithms. So. It makes that uh, end consumer um, uh, make this machine learning models more accessible because a lot of the times you just take days to try to train a model. Now you can use this automated machine learning to actually benchmark the best model to apply as well as clean up all your data sets and do the necessary data science things to your data set to make it uh, viable for a prediction model. 
Um, so yeah, Data Robots an example of that. Um, there's also robotic process automations that can do for your own job. So think about those repetitive tasks that you're doing at work, you know, when you're trying to look busy in the office. Now is the time to start thinking, well, how do I codify those processes and do it in a way to use these robotic process automations and codify those steps and make a robot to do it? Because with that, you can then, you know, just chill at home and, and do something like what this guy's doing here. Maybe not quite. Okay, so that's quarantine day six, unfortunately, for him. This is um, Tesla's sort of vision of self-sufficiency at home because they have the solar roofs that's coming along soon, and they also have the Tesla power wall to store that energy and the you know, electric vehicles, and sort of the home automations will come along the way through the Tesla app. So in terms of self-sufficiency, you can also look at, well, vertical farming. You know, if you, you no longer require the necessary supply chains, you can actually grow your own food with these vertical farms. And, um, you know, Kimball Musk and, uh, and others are actually looking at providing this sort of hyper-local vertical farming that's sustainable and uh, you know exactly where the produce is happening. Um, there's also 5G internet connectivity that's coming online through satellites with Starlink and OneWeb and a, and a range of others. So essentially these are going to have, you know, as long as you have line of sight to the sky, so you'll be able to beam down the internet. And it also uh, improve the connections globally because we no longer have these restrictions of, you know, the signals having to bypass a lot of land and cables. It's actually seeing that um, line of sight through satellite to satellite and satellite to your home. Um, so there's going to be creating a bundle of gigabit connections um, in self-sufficiency at home. There's also 3D printing. So Archivest is uh, looking at the adoption of 3D printing being at a tipping point. Um, you know, they've been saying this for a while, but I think right now it's actually get to the point, uh, the knee of the curve. So in 2015, GE pr produced the first 3D printed fuel nozzle, which combining 20 parts into one. In 2019, the GE 9X engine uh, contained 304 3D printed parts. So at this rate of adoption, adjusting for the reduction in complexity, this large percentage of the GE 9X engine could be 3D printed by the late 2020s. So if you look at this trend, you know, this is sort of the, the exponential curve that we're all used to now um, in terms of, the, especially with the coronavirus, with 3D printed parts in one aircraft engine, it's going to hit 4,000 parts into one by 2024. Um, 3D printing also, you know, looking at sort of curve around reducing the number of parts required. So this is that total over the next 20 years. Um, 3D printing has actually been done at, um, you know, for example, in hospitals, um, saving them for with these valves that have been by, printed 3D printed by these volunteers. So they've um, turned something that used to cost what eleven thousand dollars into being a dollar. Yeah, you know, using sort of 3D printers and um, helping the patients. About ten patients have used this so far, but there's about a hundred that have been printed using this method to uh, help it, help the people in the hospitals to breathe. Um, but then the downside of this is that the medical company that came up with that design is actually threatened to sue these volunteers um, for these life-saving coronavirus treatments. So the ethics and the PR discussions around, you know, what, what would you do if you had a patent that could save lives but people actually 3D printing these for, you know, against your will? So, you know, I think um, this, this sort of uh, moment of ethics has actually been discussed around 3D printing and I think now is the time to actually push companies to, to release these patents to be able to uh, allow the abundance to happen for the volunteers to save lives in the community. Um, and the last point I want to touch on is unself-isolating in the virtual world and transcending your physical self. So, you know, we've heard earlier from Aaron um, around uh, virtual reality and the events that have been cancelled, uh, that VR might be the solution to, um, to the impact the coronavirus is having on the events industry. And you're seeing these VR events that are organised by, say, Vive, HTC Vive, um, in these uh, virtual reality environments. So more and more investment will go into this to make these experiences better and more accessible um, and actually improve the quality and adoption of virtual reality. Um, Valve actually sold out on the uh, sold out immediately after being available on stock for the Valve Index um, because of the uh, Half Life Alex, the, the sort of I guess prime game that's be coming out. Uh, essentially, that will bring uh, VR to the mainstream for gamers, and also Facebook Horizon just closed their alpha. Um, this uh, the closed alpha just began this month, um, and essentially Horizons is like uh, the Ready Player One movies Oasis. So you got your Facebook avatars and be able to interact with your friends and also Facebook at work it, um, will actually have an angle in terms of getting enterprise to adopt this for their colleagues and uh, to get that sort of virtual working environment um, more, more enjoyable and more immersive. Um, this is an example well, from last um, year. What can your face do? 
Can you show us? Well, I've always hoped you would ask me that question. Um, <laughs> so I have some pretty good, I think, mouth movement. How about your eyes? Can you can you look left, right, up, down? Um, good, good, good. Yeah, I'm gonna be surprised. Ah, ooh, I like my. I think one of my favorites is puffing my cheeks. Mm, the mouthwash, mouthwash commercial. Mm-hmm. And rolling my tongue. Mm. Mm, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, not a lot <laughs> of people can do that. Yeah, so I mean, the technology that was last year. So unfortunately, F eight is um, cancelled or being made online this year. But um, that technology will be even better, and hopefully, they can create a VR event for F eight coming up. Um, this is the Tesla suit. So we had Tesla suit. Uh, the team over in at Singularity U Australia this uh, uh, late last year, and they do full body haptic suits. So this is uh, using the Tens technology for muscle stimulation. It does motion capture and avatar systems as climate control systems to simulate heat and coolness um, and a biometric system for your enterprise use cases. So this is actually here and now. They've just recently developed a haptic glove as well to actually get that sort of tactile sensation in virtual reality. And researchers are looking at how to actually create that sort of um, minute touch sensations using these air puffs at the fingertips. So this is sort of all coming online to create a better immersive experience. Um, we're looking at seeing researchers simulate the sense of taste as well. You know, think about simulating saltiness or sweetness or sourness and tanginess, um, these technologies are creating all the mimicry of our senses. Um, we've already got hearing and sight uh, and uh, the sense of smell is coming online as well. Um, so Neuralink is probably the next level with all this um, sensation mimicry because this is a brain community computer interface um, that Elon Musk is heading up. Essentially, the uh, chip and wires will be the less than the size of a penny. The wires themselves would be a tenth uh, the width of a human hair to be able to sort of not cause any damage. And these will be implanted directly into the brain using a robot, robotic surgeon. Um, this N1 chip implant over here will be able to access um, all the sort of brain waves you have the, through the electrodes um, in the wires. And uh, it will be able to access that through your your app on your phone, smartphone, to see all the things that you would like to learn and all the things that uh, it's reading in your mind. So this is sort of the future vision of brain computer interfaces. But um, they're actually doing human trials later this year to see how well they can do. And apparently it's going to be 10 times better than what the current technologies are in terms of reading and eventually writing to the human brain. So exciting times. Um, so with all this sort of uh, sensors uh, that they're mimicking through, you know, all this virtual reality and haptic touches and, and, and body suits and sense of taste and with Neuralink, we're starting to look at a world like the Matrix. So this is Sci-Fi and the Matrix saying, well, you know, I can I know that this steak is fake in the Matrix, you know, right? but when I taste it, I can't tell the difference. It's amazing. And, um, you know, ignorance, he says, is bliss. And, you know, why live through a pandemic when you can live in the matrix? And this sort of uh, imagining transcending your physical self uh, through this sort of um, digital transformation uh, is sort of the journey we're taking on. And, and a lot of this is touching on the themes of transhumanism, you know, that's transcending our physical biology uh, through science and technology using using all the technologies we mentioned earlier. And so uh, whether it's enhancing our intelligence, uh, extending our healthy human lifespan, or improving our well-being. Um, these are sort of things that transhumanists around the world are trying to advocate for. Um, in terms of human needs and well-being, you know, we, we know this from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, you know, whether it's the physiological to the safety to the love and belonging to esteem and self-actualization. Um, and we can see also from Singularity University's global grand challenges that a lot of these global grand challenges are about meeting the human needs along these Maslow hierarchy of needs. Um, you know, once we get through this sort of scarcity mindset that I mentioned at the start of this talk, you know, whether that's, you know, getting enough toilet paper rolls to make you feel safe and at home and, and your food, water and shelter, uh, then it's about, okay, well, how do we create a safety net for everyone? Uh, universal basic income might actually create a, a floor for everyone to actually get that sort of level of safety. Um, Tesla also creating these home automations and abundance of energy um, and storage. Um, and eventually also virt virtual reality you can actually connect virtually and, and feel that sense of long and belonging through these virtual worlds. 
um, in terms of esteem, we've got your social media posts and, and connectivity through other people, and then self-actualization through your smart devices, whether it's iOS or Android, to actually say, well, what is the sort of purpose you're trying to achieve by connecting to the internet? Um, eventually, with neural link to the cloud, this is sort of where you know, starting to self-transcend, I guess, which is the, the last pillar of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then we can look to the skies in terms of abundance of you know, making us uh, a multi-planetary species. So with that, you know, I'd just like to leave with you that, um, you know, automation will create this sort of journey of abundance for us. And the technologies available today and the technologies that will be going to be available tomorrow uh, will accelerate that journey. And, um, you know, I'd like to uh, stay with you and actually say, well, I'm really looking forward to that journey. So thank you very much. Peter, thank you. Um... I, you know, I work at this place and I just got a whole lot of new stuff from that presentation. That's, that's how I, on, on the edge it was. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we have, we have a lot of good questions, but I have a huge favor to ask of you if you're up for it. Um, yeah. We have the ability to make up for the last session that broke by getting Yost back on here real quick. Would yeah. you mind um, going and recording answers that we can share afterwards with the folks yeah. so that we can, we can do the future of learning session too? Sure thing. Fantastic. Well, thank, thank you for being here. Um, audience, we will get you guys uh, some answers to your questions. There's some really good ones in there. So I look forward to your answers as well. Um, and everybody, we will pull you into the next session. We're going to flip over there real quick and see if we can make up for some lost time. So thanks. Thanks, everybody. Peter, thanks for being here. We'll see you guys. Bye.